Sounds great. So we do a duet of my way. If, that, <laughs> if you guys want to. And by the way, and we're starting and we our interview off did. with the duet no, I'm, of my I'm way. Like, <laughs> we're not right. kidding. Yeah. I, I'm waiting. Sonny and Cher, we have a whole catalog. Is now, it? the time is near. No. Was this what it was on set? Yeah. Bit. Well, this we're, we're going. This is full on great stuff. This is full on yeah. already in hysterics. I'm having to calm down. Yeah, Dan is. Uh, I was just saying, Tim is one of the funniest people I've ever met. If he help, you know, throws the whole directing thing in, I think you should you should definitely look at stand comedy, comedy and stand up. I'm gonna do stand up. Yeah. How much was that? Like a five dollar or twenty dollar bill to get her to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to pay Zowie anything to, to be my shill. <laughs> sure. Um, for people that don't realize, before we go, go any further, I have to say um, a huge thank you to Kelly, Kia Telluride for being our sponsor. Uh, the only reason we get to be here at Sundance, uh, it's very expensive to be here, and Kia's been a great sponsor, and I really want to give them a sincere thank you. Um, and now, let's jump into why I get to talk to you guys. So, it's uh, the day before your world premiere at Sundance. Uh, no one's seen the movie. Are you shitting bullets, or are you super excited? Super excited for people to see the film. Absolutely. We made the film we wanted to make. Netflix supported us creatively, artistically, financially. It's rare to be able to take something that 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 is a little out of the box and unusual and, and pursue it the way we did. And we're really happy with our film and very excited for people to see it. I, I hate asking this question, but a lot, most people will not have seen it by the time they're watching this interview. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the character you play and, and how have you been describing the film to friends? I play a character called Josephina, which comes straight out of Dan Gilroy's brilliant and very, can I say strange mind? Twisted. Twisted mind. Um, she is, she's the person that kind of kicks off our story in a lot of ways. And it's a huge, incredible ensemble, as you were saying, you know, there's actors, John Malkovich, Tony Collette, Rene Russo, Jake Gyllenhaal. I mean, it's a sprawling piece. So what's really lovely is she's kind of the catalyst for where the plot ends up going. She's a very frustrated uh, gallery mm -hmm. assistant to Rene Russo's um, gallery owner. And it, how would you say that? She, she, she seizes an opportunity. She finds a man, how much can I say? Yeah, she finds yeah. a man dead in her apartment block. Uh, she goes into his apartment. She sees that he has hoarded a lot of incredible art that instantly has a very magical, strange effect. And so she decides to take the art and attempt to sort of posthumously produce him and exhibit him um, as you know, one of the greatest artists of our time is intercepted by Rene, is intercepted by Jake as an art critic and slowly the art starts to show what it's true, magical, satanic power is not satanic, but you know, it's, it gets dark. There's supernatural. A super, there's a supernatural element to it. Yeah. I cannot effing wait to see this. I'm so excited. The thriller set in the art world. Don't you think the Listen, world is ready for this? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm also, I mean, uh, I love looking at art and I love the, you know, it's, it, there's not that many movies that take place in the art world. No. It's not a, you know, it's not overexposed, if no, you will. No, not yet. Um, <laughs> uh, well, talk a little bit about where where did the idea for this come from? Are you like at a museum one day and you start having thoughts? I was in a contemporary art museum two days after Christmas a couple years ago, and I was down in the basement. There's a video exhibit, dentist chairs, rats running around, and I just thought this would be a great place for a thriller slash horror movie. But <clears throat> it's not the only reason why I did it, because... I've always been very interested in art and commerce and the intersection of it. And I think right now uh, the relationship is a very rocky one. Uh, I don't think you can judge the quality of a, of a piece by the number of views or, or the price tag. Success doesn't define a piece, but it, uh, it, it distracts a little bit from the intent. So when I realized the two, the theme and the world could be put together in the film, that's when I took off with it. How did you decide the art that you find in the apartment obviously needs to hit people. It needs to take them or transport them. How did you decide on what art was going to be there to, you know, uh, be the stuff that uh, people respond to? Uh, there were some people who read the script that thought that was the biggest hurdle that we had to cross was to make the art believable. And I feel that was in some ways. So a year before I hired uh, uh, somebody who's, who's fairly well known in the contemporary art world, uh, David Hunley. He became our art advisor and for a year we we tried different artists we created pieces we got over 100 pieces of art for the film mm -hmm. and it took it took well over half a year to do it so we've invested a lot of time in it when you do something like that does he get ownership of the art or does netflix now own it right now david and i share ownership of the art afterward 
and that was something that we negotiated and Netflix was open to it. So actually a lot of the art's gonna be at the party after the premiere in LA. So a lot of it's gonna be on display. But do you know what was so amazing about the art when you were in scenes with it or you know, trying to prepare your character in relation mm -hmm. to the art and this amazing magical supernatural thing that's supposed to happen when you look at it? It became less and less and less about the art as we went on. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Because suddenly the art was about what people were projecting onto it. Right. So the art was this central, visceral uh, thing that drives the film, but actually it became more about what each person sees in themselves you know, sees in themselves when they look at the art and how it sort of takes them over in a way, right. which was just the cleverest thing. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious, uh, in the writing process, uh, how much are you writing knowing that you want to put certain actors in these roles? Do you know what I mean? Because you have that relationship with Jake. I heard you might have a relationship with Renee. Um, you know. I used to. We broke up. We didn't break up. I was going to be like, uh, and uh, this interview <laughs> went off the rails really <laughs> fast. It's Awkward. over, Renee. Right? <laughs> You're finding about it right, on an interview. I'm I sorry. So was like, I really, it's, be it's better than a text. I, I really thought I stepped on a third rail there, and I'm so happy I didn't. Um, but no, seriously, were you writing with these people in mind, or how much is it you're just writing the script and then maybe rewriting once you find certain actors that are going to be playing I wrote the, role? the script. I wrote Jake's part for Jake, Renee's part for Renee, and... I, I had a, we have a Robert Altman like ensemble cast. There really is a Robert Altman feeling, sort of like the player in Nashville. That's a big part of the movie. There's an ensemble cast, and the problem when you get start off with Jake and Renee, the bar is so high that that rounding out the rest of the cast becomes difficult. So finding Zowie, you know, Billy for the part, Natalia Dyer, uh, Tom Sturridge, it, it it took three months longer to, to to cast this part because we were just so picky and finicky, and. Zowie is amazing. Zowie is an amazing person in the film, amazing actor in the film. It's so creative. I've started watching some of your short films. They're so good. Thanks, you should be. Dad. She's writing, directing. I think she's going to be a writer, director in the future, in addition to acting. And and uh, I like working with really creative people. And uh, Zowie fits right into it. Was it a five or a twenty dollar bill? There's no money exchanging hands no here. No money exchanging hands. Mutual admiration. What's amazing with Dan's work is. Uh, you only you only need to read a little bit of it for it to really get under your skin. So in terms of the audition process that I had, it was very um, it was very uh, simple. I did a tape. I had very few scenes. I didn't have a whole script, and I put it on tape. And as I started to do it something i don't know he's weird something just starts to take you over you read it and you go oh these are the sides these are really epic and beautifully written but you can't sense necessarily what the atmosphere of them is and it honestly it took me over in a matter of scenes so the fact that i'm even here having done the film and being involved is just it's just amazing because it's some of the best writing that i've ever experienced I'm, I'm very curious with the, how much for you changes on set and how much is it, you know, you're very much watching the commas. You know what I mean? No, I'm not watching the commas. I think the actors come in and respect the words, but I, I don't have a problem with somebody changing certain words here or there, or, or just as long as the idea of it's coming through. I want ownership of the actor. I want the actor to take ownership of the parts and, and from every aspect. So if that includes changing a word here and there, well, in the midst of a scene, what they do is so incredibly difficult. I'm not going to go, it didn't really say the right line. It was like, people can change lines and words. That's okay. As long as the intent is there. Well, like, we were open. Oh, is that my phone? I'm really sorry. <laughs> if, I, if, sorry, it's my mum calling me a lot. She's like, did you get she's there? She's so okay? I know. She's like, did you fall in the snow? Um, <laughs> cut the cords out. Cut the cord. Um, it, it was amazing because you would be on set and maybe want to change a line. And then as soon as you did and you did the take, you were like, oh, God, no, don't put the line back in. <laughs> but you would let people do it. And we they would... are built pretty tightly together. Well, it's just words. it's just there is a real flow and there is a real atmosphere. And some of the lines that Dan's written, everyone wanted to say. Like, I remember when Jake and I were doing scenes and he'd just be like, I can't wait to say this line because it's so brilliantly built uh, um like critique is so limiting and emotionally <laughs> draining that's but i think yeah. it sparked memes already yeah, you know I hope so spread it <laughs> uh netflix is actually pretty good at memes they yeah. they I, i've tr dogs. yeah ex Whoa. exactly i think a lot of people don't realize that when you are putting stuff though they actually help sell a movie uh, gifts and memes and all that stuff it really actually yeah. works they this netflix company i think is going to land on their feet 
pretty confident. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I actually want to um, ask, so they greenlight the movie. How much changes from you working with them and saying, okay, we're going to make it to what people are seeing on screen? You know, talk a little bit about the collaboration with them. Netflix is artist friendly. They want creative people there. They want to support the vision of creative people. It's, it's a very unique place to work at, and it's a very unique time right now. There's very few places that you can go in and, and say, I want to take chances on this and this and, and try this, that you'll get full support. I got that from, from Ted Sarandos down to Scott Stewart to Colin. Everybody at Netflix has been supportive of this film. It did not really change too much from the script. I think if there was the biggest change probably came in the editing room where we were really sort of tinkering with the tone of the movie because it's a mixed genre film. There's 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 humor, there is drama, there is thrills, there are ideas. So at any given moment in the film, we were dialing in what, what where we wanted to know, make sure the audience knew that we knew where we were with our genre. But apart from that, Netflix is just utterly supportive of. They want to work with artists. They want to work with people who want to make unique and interesting films. And it's a joy to work with Netflix. That that actually brings to. Uh I'm, I'm, the editing process, and I've said this again and again, is ultimately the final rewrite. So I am curious how the film changed in the editing room, what you learned from early screenings, and when did you actually see it? I still haven't seen the movie. Oh, so so I'm going to see it tomorrow. Yeah. If I can even drum up the courage to watch it. I th yeah, I, I'm bad at watching myself at the best of times, but um, what I've seen so far is has above and beyond exceeded my expectations. And in terms of what changed, I... I look at a story as, as an armature, sort of like a Christmas tree, and I want to hang as many ideas on it as possible because I, there's so many things I want to say. I mean, honestly, the reason I make films is because it's such an incredible medium to get ideas out into the world, and I just want to transmit the ideas. And I think in the cutting room, there was just certain ideas that just, it was, I didn't need that ornament. Yeah. So the armature didn't need that. Uh, there was a line, Jake has a line one time that I love this line. What if what, if what people see isn't what they want, it's what we feed them as a critic. And I so wanted that line to get in there, but it was like in the middle of the scene, it was like, it just doesn't, it has no bearing in what's going on. And there's probably like a dozen lines like that that didn't make the cut. There were musical choices that we had to dial in different, uh, uh, you know, uh, Marco Beltrami did our music and did an incredible job. And, and Marco was changing the score up until sort of toward the end. But He's kind of talented. Yeah, Marco's amazing. It's amazing yeah. music. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to switch gears and we're going to play something called Get to Know Your Sundance Attendee. I promise right. these are harmless questions. Oh, I love it. Uh, what TV show would you love to guest star on and what TV show would you love to guest write and direct? <gasps> you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to uh, pick something that's a bit weird because it's not really a show. It's kind of... Um, like it's not a drama or anything but I'm really desperate to be on or involved with RuPaul's Drag Race in any way um, it's, I don't know what what that yeah. means necessarily whether that's me doing the drag I don't think they would go for that me actually being part of the the drag competitors but if I could just be on that maybe as an assistant or I don't know like a co-anchor or something I, th I think that would be great I want to be one of the judges on the British Baking Show. <laughs> no, but that and, is not, but and not only for the food, but it, it, life seems so nice under the, the tent. Like it just seems so. Everything seems so safe. Like nothing bad could happen when you're judging the tent. It's I so hear, true. You know something? I, I hear that, but I'm also curious to like see your take on like the Good Place, or you know, yeah. because you you have an interesting. Um, you write some interesting stuff, so I'm just curious about some. Uh, you know, is, are you watching? I don't know, anything from, you know, Better Call Saul to Game of Thrones to you name it? Uh, you know, one of the things I really enjoyed this year was Ben Stiller's Escape from Danamora. Sure. I was blown away by what Ben did. And if Ben's watching, I'm hats off, man. It's like you crushed that thing, the acting, the directing. I think it's a real work of art what Ben did. And it's a limited series. It's seven parts, a true story. But I think that's something that, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't watch I don't watch a tremendous amount of, like, television in general. But, but uh but no, I thought Tim Ben did a great job. I would, I would have been proud to be a part of that. Do you have a favorite sci-fi or fantasy film? Mm. I'm not a huge sci-fi person, but the ones that I do love, I love very, very deeply. I th yeah, I think I'd have to go with Blade Runner just because I watched it probably when I was way too young and I feel like it did cognitively like form part of my personality somewhere along the line. I love fantasy, and my favorite film is has always been The Wizard of Oz. And my favorite film. Seriously, <laughs> this see, we is, never we this never is learned. A real getting see, to know you. It's always 
<laughs> that movie has everything. Everything. That movie has heart forever. It's got fantasy. It's got <sighs> characters. It's got a, a message. Oh, yeah. Home. Never leave home. So never. what are we doing here? It was, <laughs> <laughs> never, why did we leave but our home? This homes? is home. This, this is, is our home. This is we These are, are home. people. You're sure. you're you're Auntie M. Thank you. But you know what's so funny? I saw once um, a, a breakdown of it. I think in like a, a TV guide or something that was like The Wizard of Oz, and instead of a girl goes on a magical adventure, it was like a young woman meets like three strangers and assassinates people <laughs> for an hour and a half. That's I was so like, funny. That's your no wonder film. I like it yeah. so much. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, is, yeah. What film scared you as a kid? Well, The Wizard of Oz Wizard terrified of Oz. me. Those freaking flying monkeys. I, oh. That's one of the most terrifying images of all time. Yeah, and the mean trees. The, the trees. mean trees. I mean, and, yeah. I, that's where the I'm going right there. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, there's like stupid slasher movies, but I don't, those don't really count for anything. I mean, for like s scary imagery. Sure. I would go with that too. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you collect? I am not a collector. I don't, I don't have really too much stuff. I collect key cards from hotels that I stay at. Sure. And also, that's I've illegal. <laughs> by, the, by the way, thanks, I, do this, thanks, I do the same thanks, thing. Thanks. So we're both doing illegal things. Really? Yeah. But I, I do also, I have to say, I, I worked as an usher for seven years in an independent cinema in London. And I have collected, I would say, every movie stub of every film I've seen wow. since I was like 18. I've also done that. Wow. This is very interesting. There you go. I don't hear these answers too often, except yeah. for people who have the same disease as me. <laughs> uh, what? Do you remember your first movie or TV show crush? <gasps> oh, the first. I think I was probably inappropriately <laughs> young. Um. I'm significantly older than you. Marianne on Gilligan's Island. I had oh. a crush on her. I did. Oh, and also the Brady Bunch. The middle, the middle sister. Okay. Jan. Jan. I had a crush on Jan. Jan. If you're out there, Jan. So I'm still waiting. <laughs> I think. Do you know what's really weird? I feel like my first crush was maybe on a like a cartoon animal. I feel like that was a safe space to start fancying, you know, boys. Maybe you know, like animation. Right. I really had a crush on the um, dog Charlie from All Dogs Go to Heaven. Oh, okay. the animation. I think Jamie Dornan told me that his first crush was the uh, the girl, the female in Robin Hood. The animated fox. Yes, the fox. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you're not oh, alone. Do you know what? Also, I think I, I had a crush on Tramp from Lady and the Tramp. Oh, yeah. I mean, he yeah. was just yeah, he was sassy. Cool. He was doing his own yeah. thing, but tear away. <laughs> Renee's first crush was on a superhero. You guys probably didn't have in, 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 in England was uh, Mighty Mouse. We had Mighty Mouse. I love Mighty Mouse. Renee's first crush was Mighty Mouse. <laughs> and Zorro, the original Zorro. Wow. Um, and she wound up with me. How sad is that? <laughs> It's a combination of the two. Do you own any movie or TV show props? I have a lot of clothes from a show which is on Netflix now uh, that I did for years in the UK called Fresh Meat. So I have a lot of clothes. I don't know if I have any props. I think that kind of counts though. You borrowed some yeah. stuff. Yeah, I took... Uh, there were some jeans that I had graffitied slowly from like season one to season four, which are kind of a cool memento. I kept Jake's watch in Nightcrawler that he mugged the guy for. And I kept, and Roman Israel, I kept Denzel's heavy briefcase. And I have both of those in my office. I like that. Yeah. Uh, background photo on your phone? My mom and dad. Oh. I have a photo. I lost my phone, and the day that Jake said he was going to do Nightcrawler, I got a new phone, and I walked outside, and I took a picture of a rainbow, and I've always had that on a on a on 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 my phone. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, what TV show have you watched all the way through more than once, if you have? Because I know you don't watch a lot of TV. I definitely have, because I do get obsessive like that, and I kind of. Mm, Cheers, maybe? Sure. Uh, Sopranos. Um, Th these are three called like this or that. Just curious which one you're more into. Star Wars or Star Trek? I've never seen a Star Wars. That's Star Trek. So it's Star Trek. Star Trek. Right. I know I lied, I have seen one, but I think I'm more Star Trek. 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 <laughs> uh, Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad? 
Breaking Bad because I've never seen Game of Thrones. Breaking Bad because I've never seen Game of Thrones either. Wow. We are so like the same person. I know it's so weird. I'm like this is going to last forever. Uh, I already know what the answer on this one is for you, but Han Solo or Indiana Jones? Indiana Jones all the way. The rickety bridge? Come on. Indiana Jones. Uh, this is my last thing for you. Uh, I'm always curious how people... If you remember what got you into the entertainment industry as like a younger, as a kid, did you see a movie or a performance and say, oh my God, I want to be involved in that? I got involved, I did my first professional job when I was six. So I don't know if it was necessarily conscious and maybe it was just like having undiagnosed kind of hyperactive issues whereby I just had to do loads of different hobbies and then I just gradually settled on one. But I feel like the first day I walked into the drama class that I did when I was six, I saw three baskets labeled wigs, masks, and costumes. And I just kind of knew that I was mm -hmm. supposed to do whatever that was. I consider myself more of a writer than a director. So I was in college and I'd taken a term off and I was in Athens and I'd gotten brutally drunk one night, punched out my best friend and lost my passport. And I was sitting at a bar at six o'clock in the morning because I had no place to stay, and 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 I had to hand, I had to write something for this creative writing class I wanted to get into. So brutally hungover, I wrote this like three page short story, and I was like, "Oh my god! Like I know how to do this!" Like I, it was the first thing I ever tried to write. I think it was like nineteen, and it was like that's when I thought I know how to do this, which is odd. You're the real deal, Dan. I was going to say, that's a crazy story, and, yeah. and I love it. Okay. And a perfect way to end the interview. I'm going to say, sincerely, I cannot wait to see the movie. I will be there tomorrow night, and thank I sincerely you. say thank you for coming in our studio. Thanks for having us. Thanks to all at Collider. Yeah, thank great. you.